Okay, we're going to get started with the next, uh, the, the, actually the opening panel. That was the welcoming panel and we're the opening panel. Uh, I'm Ellen Hume from Central European University. I am privileged to be the Annenberg Fellow in Civic Media at the Center for Media, Data, and Society. The longer the title, the less the power. But um, what that means is that actually, since before your parents were born, I have been working on these issues of democracy and journalism. I learned everything I know, actually later on from Gordana and others in this room. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be here. I wanted to um, tell you that I'm not going to spend a lot of time introducing the panel because you have wonderful biographies. Uh, so I'm just going to have us cut right to the chase. We also hope this will be a very interactive, open media session. So we're not going to give you big, long speeches. We're going to ask you to think of what ideas and questions you want to share in this conversation this morning. So we will not spend a whole lot of time with the panel. We will turn it to you to and interact with us very shortly. Um, and I just wanted to make a few uh, comments about uh, what are open media to get us going. I think we all know that some of the critical opportunities and challenges face practical practical discussions. We ha we're hoping to have a practical discussion today, not a theoretical one. And for me, the four biggest questions are the business model. Who's going to support open media? You all know this is a problem. How do we make a living doing this? Um, you can make a living doing many things, but telling the truth is probably the, one of the hardest ways to do it. Quality control is part of this. Since the producer is no longer accountable how are we going to know whether what we are sending out or receiving or passing along is any good? We all know that's one of the critical questions, and I hope that we can start to address that also here today. Uh, I was very interested to learn of a project at Wellesley College in the United States um, where they're actually um, building a, 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 an analysis system to track where each tweet starts from. And that sounds scary to those of you working under authoritarian regimes. But on the other hand, it might help us with this effort to create verification. If a rumor is started somewhere and we can track what happened to it, uh, then it's a very interesting tool. But like all these tools, there's a double-edged sword. It can be used for good, and it can be used to stifle open media. So trust is a critical part of our conversation. I hope we will deal with that a bit today. I also wanted to share, we just had a, a presentation here at CEU. It was very interesting about how these social media tools that we are so happy to be using because they enable open media so well are not reliable because the middleman, the platform, Facebook, Twitter, are tinkering with the algorithms. So, my Facebook friends will not see everything I post, and I will not see everything they post. Why is that? How is that? Well, we have to pay attention to these platforms and figure out how are they filtering our in and out news. Also, we heard from um, a, a scholar who's in the room here today, Amelia Arsenal, about how paid propagandists are dropping little artificial news tidbits into all this with ulterior motives. Perhaps it's public diplomacy. Perhaps it's just propaganda. Perhaps it's commerce. And these little news tidbits going into our news flow will distort the picture we get of the world. We all know this as people who are creating and struggling with open media. Another area, and I know Sejal is going to talk about this, is legal protections. Who the heck is a journalist now? Who deserves legal protection? If the journalist today is, as I think, anyone performing an act of journalism, posting a video, a photo, a news bulletin from their mobile device, then how is this going to work under laws that address journalism protection, free speech, privacy, copyright, and libel? Are we going to maintain two categories, official journalists under legal protection, and ad hoc part-time amateurs who aren't? How should this work practically? We also have Jill from The Guardian, who's a legal expert. I think we're going to get a lot of expertise about this in the room. And last, oh, well, actually, second to last, is civic responsibility. I really got into journalism because I believed there was a public trust that I needed to hold and serve. 
But who holds that today? Who is actually going to be accountable and verify the content? Is it going to be the producer of the news, the purveyor of the news, the consumer of the news? Who is responsible? We've gone from a push culture to a pull culture. And unless people are media literate, I'm afraid we won't have the culture in our societies that will distinguish between what is nutritious media information and what is false or just diversionary. Finally, I would like to applaud the regional flavor of this conversation. It is wonderful to have people from all these countries. This is a hallmark of CEU. We are proud and delighted to welcome you. And I think this poses some particular regional questions. Um, what are the regional contours of open journalism in Central, Eastern, and Southeastern Europe? Does open journalism provide solutions for achieving vibrant, independent media? In countries where media outlets are struggling with financial, government, regulatory, and market pressures? These are some of the issues you've probably brought here. So panelists, I'm inviting each one to take up any of these issues, or even in one that they would prefer to inject that I haven't said, and give us a provocation or a piece of advice. I've asked each panelist, as I said, to speak only briefly at first. And we will start. Um, Frane Marojevic, who is a senior advisor at the OSCE uh, Office of the Freedom of the Media, is going to give us a talk that Dunya uh, would have given us if she had been able to be here. So will you please just start with Dunya's uh, comments? Thank you, Frane. Uh, um, good morning. Thank you very much. I'm here uh, on behalf of Ms. Dunya Mijatovic, who unfortunately couldn't be uh, with us today in person as she had to travel to Moscow to address the European Federation of Journalists to raise issues, um, unfortunately, very similar to those we are dealing with today, just in the context of uh, Russia and Ukraine. So please allow me to start off with the main message which she wanted to pass on um, here at this meeting is that over the past year, the media freedom situation in this region has only worsened. We have witnessed an alarming number of physical attacks, intimidations, death threats, and arrests of journalists. Equally alarming is that the political will of the authorities continues to be totally absent. Traditional journalism has become restricted in many ways. But the internet has provided a platform for those critical, investigative, and dissident journalists whose voices would otherwise have remained silent. This new practice of involving also the readers using their contents stirs up a variety of questions, as you have mentioned, social, legal, regulatory, and ethical. However, it is important to note that our basic human rights remain the same, offline and online. To be clear, there are aspects of the internet that do need to be regulated. Other areas, however, should be totally out of reach of government control. The challenge is to jointly identify areas that benefit from no or from self-regulation, and on the other hand, effective approaches for addressing other issues. For example, we can all agree that minorities and minors need to be protected. We also agree that we have the right to privacy, but how do we go about it? Just take the issue of online anonymity. Staying anonymous in many parts of the world is a precondition for voicing political dissent. That, if expressed in open, could prove to be life-threatening. However, it is also an online anonymity that criminals think will give them cover. We also have the right to information, to seek, to impart, and to receive information of our choice. It should not be up to anyone to decide or to define what kind of news or information it is to our benefit or worse, to a particular party or government's benefit. Today, it is almost impossible to estimate the number of blocked websites in different countries. For example, in Turkey alone, more than 50,000 websites are currently blocked. Earlier this year, both Twitter and Facebook were silenced for weeks, YouTube for months. The restrictive internet law of the country was modified twice in the last seven months, each time adding provisions that further curb online freedom of expression. Other countries also resort regularly to silencing online voices that are considered harmful or critical to those in power. 
In Serbia, we have seen an increasing trend of hacker attacks on critical websites. Social media platforms are interfered with. Social media users are arrested and interrogated. Just in the past month, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, internet servers of the Fena News and Buka magazine were attacked. In Albania, the website of the public broadcaster was hacked and replaced with provocative images. There has been a steady tightening of the regulatory environment throughout the OSC region. The excuses and pretexts are well known, often relying on an all too popular appeal to national security. It is really a matter of a regime trying to control information. In short, the notion of internet freedom is being challenged, and this trend represents a clear and present danger to media freedom. I mentioned that in many times the indispensable political will needed to change the current situation. I can only repeat how every other effort is meaningless if the political will is missing. There are international standards, including the OSC commitments, which all of your governments have already signed up to. This, one of these commitments also relates directly uh, to the issues that we are dealing with today. If I can quote, the right to the freedoms of opinion and expressions are in fact strengthened by the internet. And the OSC participating states should take action to ensure that the internet remains an open and public forum for freedom of opinion and expression as enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and to foster access to the internet. That is what your governments have committed to. These are very straightforward words and the governments are accountable to them. We need to see how to best use this and how to preserve this one internet that we have, how to ensure that it remains free, safe and global. How much or how little regulation is needed, when and where, what type of regulation fits what purpose. We need to be clear on whom do we need to protect online and why. Which areas are better off without regulation, which profit from self-regulation, where have we succeeded and failed, which measures are just over-restrictive or fig leaves to hide other objectives that regulators, uh, legislatures and politicians might have. Unfortunately, when it comes to the internet, there is no textbook solution for regulation or legislation. Shaping policies to advance media freedom online is a challenge. We all have to do and contribute together. So this is what we would like to see as a part of this discussion in the next few days. Thank you very much. Thank you, so Thank you Dunya. Good luck with your important work. Uh, to start off with the panelists now, I would, I'm going to turn to Jill, who is our, our wonderful legal expert uh, from The Guardian. And Jill Phillips is well known, I'm sure, to many of you. The Guardian has been a leader in uh, open media uh, support and uh, offering as a platform and uh, an, an ally and also creating a lot of it. So uh, Jill, would you give us some thoughts about open media now? Thank you. Thank you very much for, for having me. And uh, this is my second visit to Budapest and to the CEU. And uh, it's really fantastic to be back. So thank you very much. Now, I've, I've, I've got a couple of things that I'm going to circulate because I've decided that we need to go back to physical paper uh, so that we're not all looking and we've got something tangible. So there's two very straightforward pieces of paper that are coming around. One is just a summary, uh, really, from the Guardian's Open Journalist website about some of the things that open journalism these days allows us to do and gives us a benefit from. And in a way, it's, it's easier for you to look and, and have a look at that than me to tell you all about that. And the second thing I'm circulating are some, are some photos of some trotting horses, which I will come to uh, in a minute. Um, but it's sort of just to give everybody a nice, gentle start to the, uh, to the morning. Um, so look, I was, going to, I was going to start by just a couple of quotes. Um, one from Carl Bernstein, who said, uh, the best obtainable version of truth is what journalists at their best try to achieve. Uh, and the other quote I wanted to start with, which is one that Alan Rusbridger, my editor, likes to use, is from David Broder, um, who uh, was uh, a sage of the Washington Press Corps many years ago. And he used to say that this, this is what a newspaper is, a partial, hasty, incomplete, 
inevitably somewhat flawed and inaccurate rendering of some of the things we have heard about in the past 24 hours, distorted despite our best efforts to eliminate gross bias by the very process of compression that makes it possible for you to lift it from the doorstep and read, in, read it in about an hour. If we labeled the product accurately, then we could immediately add, but it's the best we could do under the circumstances and we will be back tomorrow with a corrected and updated version. Now, it, it seems to me that you know, one of the big things that open journalism has allowed us to do is to really advance that process. You know, we can do these things not over the course of 24 hours or 48 hours or a week, the long read on the Sunday that you used to get when you analyzed the week's news. Nowadays, this is happening all the time. And, and that's one of the big uh, benefits for open journalism. Another big benefit is um, more people are involved. The old days of the journalistic elite have gone. Journalists used to be the people who told you what was happening, and inevitably, they did it from their own perspective, with their own views. Nowadays, you've got a much more rounded 360-degree idea, and that's why I wanted to circulate the trotting horses, because for, for those of you who don't know Edward Meyerbridge, uh, he was a photographer way back when, and there was a whole debate around whether horses, when they trotted and galloped, whether their feet touched the ground or, or all four were off the ground at any one point in time. And it was a long, ongoing debate, and he managed to solve it by taking lots and lots of photos very quickly, of the horse in its various moves, and the, you've got those circulating. And they do show that there is a point in time when the horse's feet, all four of them, are off the ground. And you know, it, it always seemed to me, I went to, I went to an exhibition of his and just saw, and um, what he was doing was a 360 degree analysis of things. He was looking at it from every possible angle. And what you realize is that every angle has a different perspective. It has something to add. It adds to a tapestry that becomes deeper and richer uh, and wider uh, and says things that I couldn't say, that one of you could say. Um, and, and that seems to me, to, that's one of the great benefits of, um, of open journalism, plurality of voices, uh, tr more transparency, all these things that it offers. So th those are some of the good things. The, the, the benefits that The Guardian have, ha has got as, an, as a journalistic organization in the last few years uh, I've, so, I've, I've put those two pieces around, you can see, but you know, we, we've had the Arab Spring, our reporting on the Middle East rising, Julian Assange, uh, the Edward Snowden, uh, it, on a personal sort of level uh, in the UK, are reporting around um, what happened to a chap called Ian Tomlinson, who uh, died during some riots. Um, that all came about because of open journalism. Someone sent us a video, We'd been reporting on it. We were able to look at this. Other people sent us the video. That video told a story that otherwise would never have properly been told. Um, and I don't know if any of you are listening to, there's a, there's a rather fantastic radio uh, thing going on uh, called Serial at the moment, which is an analysis of an old US murder, murder case back in from the 1980s. And it's, it's, it's on a blog. And it's just doing this really detailed analysis, bit by bit, time over time. I mean, and that's what's fantastic. But there are all sorts of responsibilities and challenges that, that come out of that. Now, I, I'm going to leave uh, Sejal to do most of the, the legal challenges. But I did want to say, just from a personal perspective, again, when I started as a media lawyer back in 1984 or 5, um, you know, we could micromanage legally what the product was. We could lawyer it before it was published. We had a deadline at 7 o'clock every night. We had one hard physical paper that went out and then you could go to bed and wake up the next morning and start again. Now, it's 24 hours, it's 365 days a year, and it's probably more than that because we've got US and Australia, and so that circle never ends. It's rolling news. So if I look at something on our website now, in 10, 10 minutes it might have changed. Uh, you know, so the legal risks just through that process are, are enormous. It's not just about UK law anymore, it's about global law. I don't know anything about Hungarian media law. If we publish a story ab about a Hungarian, I've got no idea whether I'm breaching the law or not. Of yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, there are all sorts of practical issues around that. Um, but also, I think 
journalists are themselves much more exposed. You know, they have a higher profile. They're being challenged on their accuracy. That elite role that they had uh, is no longer theirs. And some of them find that quite hard. It's very challenging for them. Uh, you know, journalists' names go on pieces. That's, for, from the commercial journalist, that's what you do. Your name is there. There's a, there's a lot of people who can say more safely, maybe hidden behind anonymity. Is that good or bad? You know, Oscar Wilde said, give a man a mask and he'll tell you the truth. Uh, but, you know, journalists have been doing that with their names and their heads above parapets for a long time. So, difficult areas around there. Um, and in addition to the sort of challenges around who is a journalist, you know, th there, there are some of the, the, the things that Ellen's touched upon. So, you know, what, what standards do you apply to the internet? Uh, the, is the Guardian to be subjected to the same principles as Vice or BuzzFeed or Twitter or a citizen journalist or the BBC um, or Google? Who, who controls all these things? Who's going to set those standards? Who's going to enforce them? Um, and, and how do you enforce them? And, and finally, I just wanted to touch briefly on verification, which seems to me, again, to be a, real, a really difficult issue. Uh, and to do that bit that The Guardian does so well, and the mayor culpa, those of you will, may recall that we had this great Syrian lesbian blogger um, who we relied on for quite a long time to tell us what was going on in Syria, only it subsequently turned out that this was a sort of 20-year-old man based in Scotland who'd been pulling the, wa the, wa the, the wool over our eyes very successfully for far too long. And, and we had not been challenging enough to our own journalism about this. And when you're taking stuff from remote sources, uh, there are responsibilities around that in, in terms of how you verify uh, those things. So uh, the final thing I want to say was on control. You know, again, at the moment, we're all, we're all sort of reeling slightly from Google Spain and, tr and, and the right to be forgotten case and trying to decide what we do about that. And that raises issues about who is controlling information. I mean, you know, information, Article 10 rights have always been about receiving and um, imparting information. And there's always been a bit of a battleground around who controls the flow, the state, the journalist, the private individual. And I think one of the things that's come out of Google Spain are there are seven sort of potential interested uh, groups or organizations um, who, who are going to be involved in this debate. So, you know, you've got, you've got Google and your search engines. You've got the individual who's got privacy rights. You've got state regulators. You've got the publisher, people like my organization, the, the, the traditional publisher. You've got the public who have the right to receive information. You've got state courts, and then you've got European or other courts. So there are all these interested groups, and at the moment they're all fighting and battling over who ultimately is going to sort of control, if you can, any of this. So that's enough from me. Thank you very much. And I'm really looking forward to the rest of the uh, morning and the debate. Thank you, Jill. I, in fact, love the image of the horse's feet off the ground. And I want to pair it with the Kafka quote that Gordana gave us, that uh, we make the path by walking. So let's not be horses off the ground this morning. Let's be sure that we stay practical as we look at these issues. I, I think that you have had enormous amount of practical experience to share. And I know there are a lot of interstitial moments when you will be able to network and talk to Jill about your own practical questions and issues. Um, thank you so much. I wanted to turn now to Lenart Kucic, uh, who is uh, a, himself a technology and media correspondent. Can you share with us from your own uh, setting, uh, how do I pronounce it, Delo? Delo? Uh, from your own news organization, from your own work, how you're facing these issues of open media? Uh, yeah, well, for us it's a bit funny. Tech correspondents are sort of geeks, and uh, we did this open journalism collaborative thing, open source organization of workflow like 20 years ago. But um, when you come to work in a traditional news organization, it's, it's hard for you to adapt you know, to this very old media way of doing things. So um, 
when I first heard about this Guardian initiative, I, of course, introduced it to my editors and said, well, this looks like a good idea because we are not very, you know, trusted. Because, uh, and uh, what turned out to be the case is that journalists sort of love our readers as long as they're buying our products and keep quiet. <laughs> Don't want to you know, contest us. Or, and uh, this open journalism thing necessarily opens up um, your elite position in question. Uh, it started with um, comments. You know, it seemed like a great idea to give people the opportunity to comment on our articles. And uh, everybody thought it was great, but you know, as first anonymous comments appeared uh, under your article, uh, you didn't really feel this good. Or you actually start feeling like maybe we should block it or edit it or don't let those people comment it or at least do something about anonymous comments because we're getting all, you know, they, it really becomes pretty nasty. And the same happened whenever we opened up to the readers, it created a lot of problems on what to do with it. Uh, it's hard to make any useful points, you know, from, from the comments because a lot of it is just, you know, comment or even evil or not really useful. I can't say that in my entire, inter well, internet journalist career, I have ever seen uh, a comment under, you know, any of the article threads that could actually lead to an interesting story. Maybe it's just a question of tradition, but it's not very useful, you know. Traditional sources still remained the same. You know, if you trust a journalist, then your source will come to you, and then something will come out of it. It's never in the open. Then we started with experimenting with what about if we make our own um, leak platform, something to be safe, a safe depository, so that the whistleblowers will be able to contact us and give us something. But it again turned out not to be the case because what we got was a lot of um, astroturf. Uh, a lot of stuff that cannot be verified, uh, a lot of things, you know, that were written very emotionally about I'm being harassed by the boss and blah, 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 and all the rumors about things. You, what can you do about it? It's, again, quite difficult. So I think that that's why traditional media organizations are wary and, well, say, well, maybe it's a good idea, but it's not very useful. Uh, but how to get more trust? I don't know. Uh, I, a year ago, I was invited by a small startup to be um, to become a member of a hmm, let's say advisory board, and their idea was we want to have this competitive advantage on the market. We want to make this different. We'll be open. We'll be transparent, and they were actually talking about this open journalism concept. Um, they were crowdsourced. Uh, they went you know, to the people, uh, to the industries, to startups, to the readers to support the case. They said, we want to raise 25,000 euro, and we can, if we can make it, then we have enough for a year to make an experiment. And they reported, like, you know, every, every month they had reports uh, who contributed, how, and, and they had stories. It was data journalism, investigative journalism, up to very high standards, uh, interesting things with follow-ups that most media wouldn't pick up and, 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 pers and pursue. And um, they had their first meetup with the founders and the readers and whoever wanted to join. And the editors were sitting in front of all the audience and they, um, introduced the project, and they discussed lively about stories, about how they pursue, how they do it, uh, and discuss also, you know, what should be, what should we do next? Do you have any ideas, you know, are there any other important stories in Slovenia that we should tackle? And there were like millions of ideas, you know, what should be done, but at one point, you know, the poor editor said, well, we're a startup, we have like 20,000 euro, we cannot save this country. Uh, and uh, no, we cannot be an NGO and journalists um, and the government uh, and the anti-corruption commission. We're only journalists. What we can do is we just present the facts, give it open, give it up to discussion, and well, civil society and you as citizens, we also have to do our part. 
And uh, there was also an interesting sigh by the editor, you know, being flooded by all these ideas. And he said, well, I'm receiving so many emails on what should I do and what should we cover. But at the end, um, it's not really making my life any easier to have all these comments and ideas because at the end, I'm still the editor. I still have to decide and take responsibility. And I think that that's something that every media company, be it closed or open, faces at the end. You are still the editor. You are still the one who signed under your article. And it's still the best approximation of truth given time and deadlines. But what I think is more important is to uh, regain um, this trust that we as journalists are only people who made mistakes. In this region, I, I don't think that there still is any idea of journalist mistakes. We, we cannot do mistakes. Uh, somebody is behind us. Somebody is saying to us what to do, what to write. There is a propagandist, there is a lobbyist, there is somebody, it's just no space for mistakes. That you do something with your best intentions and something is wrong and can be corrected. Um, I think that this in this region is lacking this idea that we're just making mistakes as every other professions. Everything is very near to conspiracy theories. And uh, what you can do and what those guys at this small news portal can do, and are probably now the only media in Slovenia that have this verification process to say, well, yes, we can make mistakes, but we have these open data sets, we have these methods, and we made these articles with such conclusions, and it can be verified, and you can also comment on that. So I think that this verification or the process of verification is very important if any news organization should regain some trust that's been lost in the last 20 years. Thank you very, excuse me, thank you very much, Lenart, about telling us about what's happening in Slovenia and how hard it is for uh, legacy media organizations with professional expectations and standards um, to fit into this new environment. But I do think you've touched on an important point, which is that the legitimacy of the old media has really been under assault uh, for good reason. And that by opening it up, that creates perhaps a greater legitimacy by having the public's voice and corrective capacities, but also it erodes the sense of who's accountable. Uh, and you as the editor feel you still must be accountable for your own news product. Um, and so this is the great tension. Uh, the idea of the conspiracy theories in this region, I have to say, this is a huge problem. Uh, people. I don't think really understand the journalism process or what its professional ideals are and uh, are more likely to think that it is some sort of conspiracy, and sometimes it is. So these, you've surfaced some very important issues. Um, I think that that's a good voice for us. I would like to turn now to our own from CEU, Sejal Palmer. Uh, she comes to us uh, originally from a, a varied background you can read about. Uh, she's now an assistant professor in the Department of Legal Studies, but when I first met her, she was wor working at uh, the great British uh, press freedom organization, uh, Project 19. What, what? I'm sorry, Article 19. It's too early in the morning for me. Article 19. Sejal, could you share with us some of the legal aspects that you've been thinking about? Sure. So as a human rights lawyer, as an international human rights lawyer, I think um, my contribution could be answering two very fundamental questions. Um, one, um, what are the legal and specifically human rights implications of this? Um, notion of open journalism, and why is it important to take a human rights perspective of this emerging debate first? And then um, secondly, to what extent should the protections and privileges which um, courts, international bodies, and um, uh, domestic courts have accorded to traditional media, to what extent should those be extended or adapted to those individuals who rely on um, open journalism now? And given that this is a new area and that there will be a number of questions which courts haven't answered, in, in fact, most of these questions courts haven't answered yet, what are the underlying principles that we should be thinking about applying in this, in this realm? To put it bluntly, are traditional journalists special anymore, given open journalism? 
if they ever were special at all, in terms of their rights and privileges. Um, so, uh, turning to the first question, why is it important to understand the legal, specifically human rights um, dimensions, I'm going to draw upon an article written in the Wall Street Journal earlier this month by um, an international human rights scholar and practitioner, Philip Alston, who is now the UN Special Rapporteur on um, Extreme Poverty, but has held a number of um, positions. In the context of why the World Bank should take human rights law seriously, um, he's given uh, a number of um, indications about the value of, of, of human rights. And I'm going to draw on them and adapt them for this particular area, this new area of open journalism. So why thinking about rights is important for open journalism? First, the context and framework that human rights delivers in this new emerging debate. Um, these rights point to legal obligations on states that states have, have themselves agreed to and their underlying social values, um, which inform their um, interpretations. And courts, um, but also other relevant actors, um, including uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and Regional Rapporteurs on Freedom of Expression and Freedom of the Media, have interpreted. So these uh, principles have been reflected upon, discussed, adjudicated upon. So we have this normative background through which we can gain a sense of normative clarity about, about what, um, what law, what, what legal uh, principles should apply in this realm of open journalism. And finally, um, the human rights perspective gives us a sense of the dignity and the agency of individuals, whether they are journalists or not. Um, so these are some reflections which I gained from a piece uh, which has nothing to do with journalism, but nonetheless, I think, is helpful in articulating why human rights perspectives are important in this realm. So turning to my second question, I'm going to be quite short. Um, are journalists special anymore, if they were at all? So on the one hand, it's interesting to observe that international courts um, and authorities have recognized that journalists have a kind of enhanced level of protection because of their specific role in society, because of the role that the media plays in a democratic society. Um, it's been variously referred to as um, one of the cornerstones of society or the media as a public watchdog in society. And as a result of that, the media has had um, a sort of enhanced um, role. And this has manifested itself in various ways. I've done some work on the protection of journalists recently um, from physical attack and violence. And it's interesting to see how seriously, um, uh, or not, um, but courts take attacks on journalists as being violations not only of the right to life, but also of the freedom of expression because of the particular role they play in society. And as a result of that, journalists' um, protections include um, protections um, against um, being attacked. Um, and the duties on states um, relate to the duties to um, punish um, violations, of the safety and physical, physical integrity of journalists, as well as the duties to protect journalists from attack and prevent them um, from being attacked. Um, but in addition, there are these uh, functional um, aspects of the journalists' work, which has meant that courts have recognized certain freedoms um, that they have, certain protections that they have, um, in addition so uh, these include um, the freedom to report on matters of public interest, um, freedom to uh, present information in the, the way they choose, and editorial freedom um, as well. A freedom to exaggerate, to provoke. A freedom to make mistakes, in fact. Given the perishability of news, um, there is also jurisprudence on um, the need to get the story out there. The perishability of news means that journalists do not need to check absolutely all the facts in a report published by a government um, uh, agency. They can accept it to get the story out there. The journalists can assume, in other words, that um, the report has a certain status and this, uh, the facts are, are correct. 
And um, one of the most important dimensions of the protection of journalists is the confidentiality of journalistic sources. This is a crucial aspect of the pre-publication phase of the journalistic process. And if the confidentiality of sources is compromised, that means that there is a huge chilling effect, um, not just on uh, media freedom, but also um, more, more generally. So there are certain special, if you like, journalistic rights and privilege which are out there. Um, however, the premise of this whole discussion from a rights perspective is freedom of expression. And freedom of expression is not just a right which is exercised by the media, but by all, um, whether online or offline. Um, and the question is, to what extent do these, some of these privileges, um, such as confidentiality of sources, um, the freedom to exaggerate and provoke, to what extent do these apply to those who engage in open journalism? Now, there are a number of reasons why um, journalists, um, traditional journalists, aren't so special anymore, and you can make a case for this in various ways. So I have five arguments for this. The first is that increasingly, international authorities, um, in particular the UN Human Rights Committee, the UN Special Rapporteur, the OSC um, Special Representative on Freedom of the Media, have defined journalism expansively. Not to define who is a journalist as such, but the function of journalism um, specifically. A function which the Human Rights Committee has said in its authoritative interpretation of international law on freedom of expression, general comment 34 if you're interested, a function shared by, quote, a wide range of actors, including full-time reporters, but also analysts, bloggers, and others who engage in a form of self-publication in print or in, on the internet. Um, the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe has also adopted an expansive notion. And what is interesting is that in considering attacks on journalists and media workers, just in April this year, the Committee of Ministers highlighted that in terms of those who are subjected to restrictions on their freedom of expression in the public interest, it's not, of course, just journalists who are under attack, but professional, um, sorry, um, but individuals who quote, contribute to public debate and exercise journalistic activity and public watchdog fun functions. So the first argument is about this expansive notion of journalism. Um, uh, the second is that there are many protections to journalists which are already extended to those carrying out a public watchdog or a social function. Um, specifically NGOs who are acting in the public interest. And this has been well recognized by um, the European Court of Human Rights in particular, including in a case concerning the Euro uh, um, Hungarian Civil Liberties Union. Um, so you can make an argument that because of this extended role to um, individuals or groups operating in the public interest, that actually those who engage in open journalism should also have access to such protections. Um, the third reason is that the internet is a forum of public debate for the ordinary citizen as well as journalists has been recognized to, quote, have no less power, powerful effect than the media. A very helpful case which um, 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 speaker who uh, is speaking later on this afternoon, knows much more about Yildirim and Turkey. Uh, Yaman Akdeniz um, uh, was an important player in that case. Um, and the fourth reason is, quite simply, that human rights instruments should be interpreted as living instruments, um, keeping in with the times. They should be practical and effective, not theoretical and, and illusory. Um, this is a, uh, a principle of the European um, uh, Court of Human Rights jurisprudence. Um, so it, it's very e easy, I think, um, to make a case for an expanded notion of what is, what is journalism, even though there are these core journalistic privileges which uh, may have existed once, um, but are also changing. But there are a number of challenges and questions. What are the boundaries? Um, a question that um, Jill Phillips asked in an earlier um, debate at the OSCE, who has the mandate to determine what the public interest is? Who is undertaking a public watchdog role? And um, a final question is about, okay, there are these protections and privileges, but what about the duties and responsibilities? 
Um, how do you define those? What is, what, is, what is the role of journalist unions, for example, the International Federation of Journalists, um, uh, you know, in terms of coming up with codes of ethics or other um, best practice standards um, for um, those engaging in open journalism? Okay, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Sejal. Um, how many here <clears throat> in our group are engaged in any kind of legal battle at the moment? Look at you. Brave souls. Okay, you have some wonderful technical expertise here. Help build your network, including exchanging information about what you know and what you need to know with our experts. I'm so glad that uh, we have some legal help here for you. Uh, I wanted to now turn to uh, actually the, uh, Frane again, who wonderfully shared Dunya's opening uh, thoughts. And Frane works closely with Dunya at the OSCE, uh, representative of the Freedom of Media. And uh, Frane, what should we be thinking about as we work together on creating this network to promote open journalism, open media? Um, thank you very much. Um, for us as an intergovernmental organization, um, our primary role is to deal with the governments themselves uh, as the first target. So one of the things that um, the representative has launched is a series of discussions and debates in our office together with the 57 governments, which includes all the countries represented here, plus many others. I think the OSC covers what we tend to call region from Vancouver to Vladivostok, so North America, whole of Europe, um, Central Asia thought Caucasus. And it is important that these governments also get an understanding what, what they are dealing with when it comes to changes in journalism. From, from some cases, you do realize that it is ignorance. They are also very much stuck in an old notion of journalism, I think as uh, Jill said at her introduction, you know, you have a newspaper, it's finished, it's done, I've read it, there is a clear line of editorial responsibility and so on. So they have this very uh, strong idea there. Of course, there are many governments and many people in governments who also take this opportunity to uh, clamp down on dissenting voices, on other voices, as I said already in um, Dunya's remarks, um, that you know, uh, these are opportunities for governments to uh, uh, oppress as well, because they see, oh, these people are not journalists, and there is a new um, level of uh, debate and discussion which is happening online, which may not be happening uh, through some of the traditional media. So what we have done in our office is try to engage the country representatives themselves, the states and the governments in this debate so they can understand what we are dealing with, what we are talking about, and so they can uh, at least try to ensure that when they start designing policies, they do take human rights into consideration, and in this respect, from our own perspective, the right of freedom of expressions and the right to free media as important cases and important points. So we had two of these sessions, and I would like to maybe read out some of the recommendations which Dunya gave out to the 57 states as their representative. They selected her, they gave her the mandate, so she now comes back to them and says, okay, this is what I think uh, you should do when it comes to open journalism. The countries need to acknowledge that journalism has irreversibly changed and that the new actors are also contributing to the public debate through the media. And the internet is just another medium when we talk about, for example, freedom of expression uh, as enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It does not talk about freedom of radio, freedom of television, or freedom of the press. It talks about freedom of expression, regardless of the method that we employ to exercise that freedom. So this is important. I think you just m mentioned here, uh, the countries need to reframe from trying to define who is a journalist. Uh, this was difficult to define uh, more than 25 years ago, and it's even more complicated today. Do not do it. It is not possible, it is not useful, it is not helpful. I think what we can talk about is the act of journalism, and even that is, becomes more difficult, to, also difficult to define, and what is the public the interest and so on. These are very complicated, and each uh, case, in each context, needs to be taken on almost a case-to-case -case basis. We cannot put down a prescription 
and say, okay, this is it, because it will change, it will develop, it will evolve. So this is important. Um, as I already said, human rights remain the same online, offline, or as I would like to say, they remain the same whether you're in a bath or outside the bath and, you know, on the moon and whatever. Um, but the new media actors, the new people involved in this uh, process need to enjoy at least some of the protection and privilege that were in the past granted to the traditional media. And the last point so far is that there is a need to improve media and internet literacy for the public uh, so that they have a better understanding of the new environment and that they can also be part of the critical assessment of the process and where the information is coming from. And you, you mentioned the, this whole complicated idea of uh, checking, of uh, verification. It's, it is a complex issue. But the people who are consuming also need to understand what they're consuming, how they're consuming, that a tweet may not be the whole truth and nothing uh, but the truth. Uh, in a way, we, we, let's say, grew up in, some of us grew up in societies where you, what you saw on television is the truth. What you saw at 7.30 on the main news was the main truth of the day. And this is, was never the case in the first place, and is, that is definitely not the case today. When you have a plethora of sources, you have bombarded with interest. And if you look at, let's say, any of the big current issues, and for me, particularly the crisis in Ukraine, but very interesting to follow from the social media aspect, from the news aspect. The number of sources that are coming in, but the number of disinformation, the number of propaganda that is also being placed through the social media channels to try and affect is just amazing. It is incredible. And you really need to be able to sit back, check, uh, filter and have a better understanding what you are reading, what you are consuming. So it is important for the governments to invest in this as part of, I would say, a greater education effort so that people have an understanding of what it is that they are dealing with, how they are consuming news today as was the case, as opposite to the case that was before. Thank you so much. That, that was very rich. And I'm reminded when you talk about the ignorance of governments and frankly also of many ordinary people about how journalists have worked and try to work. I think of Lenart's uh, observation that they tried to open up their news process uh, to the public a bit to say, here's what we're trying to do, here's how we do it. Uh, I think it's very important. Media literacy is very important. I would just put in a tiny little uh, thought of my own on that because this is one of the areas that I think about the most. And that is that when we teach and, uh, in schools and when we teach people media literacy skills, it's not just to build cynicism about the content that they're consuming. Many media literacy uh, uh, workshops just say, this is advertising, this is propaganda, beware, you know, you're being used, you're being manipulated, it's all a conspiracy against you. Some of that is absolutely true and vital. But we need to help people find the nutritious bits. We need to help them judge how and when should I trust something more than something else. That's why that Twitter bug is interesting to me. That's why I think trying to create a, a, some sort of accountability for media is, is very important. But this is a very complicated and emerging field, as we've seen. And um, I really think uh, we've had some good starts. Now it's your turn out there. Um, and I think Eva has a microphone. Or no, it's Dumi has a microphone. Uh, who would like to make a very brief comment or ask a question? Yes, please, and please tell us your name and who you are. Yeah, hi, my name is uh, Stuart Chisholm. I'm with the Open Society Foundations. And this is actually a question maybe for Jill and, 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 and Sejal about um, the experience now of lawyers also in defending cases of surveillance against journalists. We've just seen today now an announcement coming out of the UK of six journalists there with the National Union of Journalists suing the UK government for surveillance. Um, and the question is really, do you think that lawyers are, are properly prepared to defend cases like this? Because um, standards are just developing in regards to what the, you know, uh, uh, around surveillance and what's appropriate and what's not. So I just want to be interested to get your, your feedback on that. The case that Stuart's referring to is, this has all really come out of the Edward Snowden 
revelations. And, and I think whether you, ag you agree, and I suspect most of this audience is probably more in agree agreement with what Edward Snowden did than in disagreement, but whether you agree or disagree, what, what Snowden has done is shine a light into some very dark areas. And the extent to which this phrase national security is used by state agencies to justify all sorts of things. Um, and, and it sort of started off as, as, as this sort of mass collection of data. And a lot of people didn't really engage because they sort of said, well, it's not really me. I'm not doing anything wrong. The you know, lines that, that in history we're very familiar with. But I think what, what's coming out of it now is that there's been much more specific surveillance going on and extraction from data and observations. And you know, on, on one level, um, Stuart, the you know, surveillance of journalists is not new. Even in the UK, you know, we had Sally, Sally Mura, who was a regional journalist on a local paper, was, was, was covering a couple of stories that she had a police source for. The police bugged her car, raided her house, took her computer, you know, and, and, and she, eventually um, she was being prosecuted. Eventually it was all dropped. Uh, but, but it went quite a long way through the trial process. So on one level, this isn't, this isn't new. The techniques are you know, more covert uh, and, and hidden. Um, and I think the law, is, the law is there to grapple with it. And I think lawyers, human rights lawyers on, on, on uh, Sejal's old, old side are, you know, are very savvy about it. Um, you know, one of the interesting things I've always thought is that free speech is one of those rights that is constantly in conflict with other rights. And when, when, you're, when you live in the free speech world, which I do, um, you sort of go, why aren't all human rights, civil liberties lawyers in the same camp as me? And that's because some of them are, are, are protecting privacy and things like that. And so there's a constant, this constant conflict um, with these rights. And what some of this is doing is pulling together a, a sort of much more cohesive, it seems to me, a, um, um, group of people who are actually saying, this, this is something we can all buy into. It's not uh, about people saying terrible things that we really don't like and don't agree with and are intrusive or defamatory. Um, and so, you know, we, we don't buy that. Um, so, you know, I, th I think there's, there's quite a lot of, uh, of, of room for us all to get together on these things. Uh, and, you know, it's not just, from my perspective, this is not just, what's come out of Snowden is not just about journalists. You know, they, they've been doing this to lawyers. They've been doing this to, to, to legally privileged communications. They've been doing it to correspondence or communications between MPs and prisoners. You know, communications that should be confidential. And, um, you know, these things have got to be challenged. And, and part of the problem is when you, when you play this national security card, everybody goes running. Uh, judges go running. They're not willing to, to challenge it. And, you know, we've just had this secret trial in the UK where if the journalists and the, and the press organizations hadn't got involved and said, you can't hold trials in secret in this country, and you certainly can't hold anonymous trials in secret. And, and you know, it was the media who went and challenged that and won and got people named. And you know, what's really come out of it, there's got to be a retrial about some aspects, so I have to be a bit careful about it, but it was sort of segued up into completely open, semi-closed with journalists allowed to be there but they had to put their notes in files and they're only going to be allowed to refer to that if down the line they decide that they can make it open and then still completely secret. You know, and I still have really grave misgivings about all of that as a process. I, 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 it, it's a difficult dilemma because journalists want to know things and journalists will sell their souls sometimes to find out things. But if you do that and actually what you've done is um, you, you effectively allow the government to have more secrecy because they can control it. I, I'm not sure about that. So I think there are all sorts of, you know, really, and, and we're, this is, a, this is a, as, as Ellen said, it's, you know, we're in a learning process here. This is, some of this is new, some of it's old, but we're moving those old concepts into this new world. I'm actually really glad that these cases brought on behalf of journalists are now trickling through, because so far, um, the overwhelming emphasis in the post-Snowden um, era has been on the right to privacy. And actually, it's only now with the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in these cases that you get um, 
a specificity in terms of which groups are particularly vulnerable, and it's the media and it's, yes, um, lawyers. There was a very interesting, for, you, for everybody's knowledge, um, a very interesting report done by ACLU and Human Rights Watch over the summer um, on the uh, uh, disparate impacts of NSA surveillance in the United States upon um, journalists and lawyers in the US, taking a rather small pool, only about 50 um, journalists who work on national security issues, but looking to see how um, surveillance has chilled their speech, not only chilled their um, expression, their reporting, but also made it slower. Um, so th surveillance has had a number of sort of different impacts upon journalists' activities. The concern in the cases um, that I know of emerging in the UK has been um, concerning um, chilling effect, yes, but also specifically how um, dragnet surveillance under the legal framework in the UK has um, impacted upon the confidentiality or the protection of the confidentiality of sources. Because um, if the um, security agencies are um, surveying um, journalists' communications, then the protection of the identity of the sources is no longer, um, is no longer there, um, and that's threatened. And yet, from a legal perspective, as I indicated, that is one of the um, most sacred, if you like, protections that journalists have in the European um, context. Um, so uh, I think this is just the beginning of the cases, actually. Um, Gavin Miller QC is involved in the Bureau of Investigative Journalism case. Um, this one, I'm not sure whether it, it's linked or has similar um, issues, but um, yeah, I think that there are going to be more um, brought by journalists. And actually, just in terms of the, um, the advice to everybody else, I, th I think this should um, embolden and hearten, you know, especially those in, involved in journalism in Europe, that there is um, the possibilities for challenging um, uh, surveillance based on national security justifications on the grounds of journalist protections out there. So, um, so yeah, you know, you can watch this space, but also um, understand the legal protections so you can um, protect yourselves and argue your cases too. Um. Prani? I just wanted to jump in with something else. I mean, I think it's very good that there is a debate and a discussion happening on these issues uh, post Snowden now in the UK and the US. It shows a healthy, democratic, vibrant society which is debating these issues. What I'm more afraid of is the countries where these issues are not being raised or debated. Um, I think it's been mentioned that this is, uh, by Jill, that this is not new. I'm pretty sure that the governments always wanted to know about what the journalists were talking about and the correspondence with their anonymous sources. So I can only assume that many, many other governments are also engaged in the same kind of activities. It's just that we don't know about it at this point. We have a hand up there, the gentleman in the green. Hi, thanks. Uh, over here. Yeah, my name is Doman. I'm from Slovenia. I'm supposed to be the, the NGO guy from our group. Uh, <laughs> and I have a question which might sound silly, but still, uh, is there, you're all media people, and often in, in the public discussions, we're often talking about uh, how, what should the media look like? So what kind of uh, information should the media, should the media gather, should the media research and stuff like that? But do you as media people have like internal debates about what the public should be like? So if we're reversing the, the, the role, is there, a, is there a, an, an ideal type of public who reads your, your media? Oh, I love that question. <laughs> you have to let me go first, please. <laughs> I spent years and years as a journalist trying to get the public to care. And I had a terrible time with it. And I know you out there doing your great journalism are finding it hard to get traction when you write an expose. Some people in the room I know have had tremendous effect from their stories. Of course, we've talked about Edward Snowden, who is technically not a journalist, although we could have a long debate about that, um, who had a huge effect, uh, and, and others in this room. But how do you not only survive writing an investigative piece, uh, because some elements will come after you, certainly, but how do you get the public to care? How do you get them to act in a democracy, in an open society? This is one of the great dilemmas. That's why I wanted to just return to this issue of media literacy. 
the way we try to build protection for ourselves is by having a public that cares whether we're dead or alive. A public that cares that we have the ability to get this information out and that, that we do this correction every day, as you mentioned, that we don't just give one story, but that we keep updating the story and we're sure we're open to new information, even if it's not good in the comments section, it will come in in some other ways. If we don't have public support, if we don't have an educated public that knows the difference between the propaganda and the real efforts, and I call them efforts, that journalists make, whether they're professionals or non-professionals, then we're sunk, we're finished. So you NGO guys out there, you have such an important role to help us build a civil society uh, culture that supports journalism. But I would not want to uh, speak and, alone. Please, Leonard, speak. And if I just, just one more remark. I'm not talking about uh, recognizing proper, proper journalism, whatever that is, but I'm talking about reacting how do you measure engagement of your readers? So, so you publish a piece about, I don't know, a, a government being corrupt. What's the, what's the appropriate public response or what's the appropriate metric to measure public response? Is it uh, protests? Is it uh, call for resignation? Is it, I don't know, yeah, so. Well, it depends on each case, obviously. Sometimes it protests uh, the, uh, in, the internet tax here in Hungary uh, sparked some really interesting protests and they've changed their policy for one reason or another which we still have to learn more about. Uh, but did you want to speak about the answer to that? Uh, well, for the first part of the question. Uh, a couple of weeks ago I had a very interesting discussion with a guy. He's a former classmate. Um, and he's a doctor. And I was quite surprised when he said, well, you know, you and I or our professions, they have something in common. Because if I say, well, I have a headache, or something is itchy here, or uh, my guts, uh, you can say pretty much whatever you want. You can say, well, have an aspirin, or maybe marijuana is really, I heard that marijuana is really great for migraine. Um, and uh, you can also try, you know, these magnetic crystals uh, that are sold there, or maybe, mm, you can do it. You're not a doctor. But if somebody asks me the same question, I, I just cannot answer in such a way because all this, you know, my profession and training and everything, I, I have to stick to the conventional medicine. And uh, I know that conventional medicine is wrong. I know what big pharma does. I, don't, I know how underfunded we are. I, I know that I cannot take enough time, you know, to speak to a patient. I, I cannot make uh, everything correct and right. But still, you know, I have to stick to this. And you as journalists, I think, is the same. Because if you want to uh, write, you know, an article about something and write down your name, you, you sort of, you're in a similar position. I want to believe when I read it that you still also have something like we have, like in traditional medicine, that you say, well, this is medicine and this is not medicine. And he said, but we're also in trouble because you have all those bloggers and rumors and different sites, and we have, you know, the homeopaths, the shamans, the, and it's sort of difficult for me as a doctor, you know, to compete with those people because they address what people want to hear. They comfort, they consolate, uh, they give answers they want to hear, they manipulate, they do all sorts of stuff. Maybe they're also helping somebody, but you, you can never know. And his point was sort of that, um, this debate whether who's a journalist or who is a doctor nowadays when everybody reads the internet, has access to all this, is, well, in many ways irrelevant or is just helping those people who want to dilute truth uh, almost indistinguishably. That everything is a fact, everybody can have, you know, their own facts, their own truth, their own interpretation. Uh, I'm not saying that we should go, you know, back to this traditional idea who's an expert and who can speak about stuff. But I think that uh, all public groups, be it the scholars, the doctors, the journalists, have to really think about, you know, why and what kind of social symptom is also that nobody and nothing and no expertise and no fields being trusted and how to regain this trust. Um, just, a, just a couple of sort of things to, to throw into the mix. Uh, uh, on Monday, The Guardian are in, uh, in the Supreme Court in, in the UK uh, on a case involving some private correspondence with Prince Charles and various 
government ministers, and this is a case that's been wending its way for a long time through the courts. And we've done pretty well. We've won quite a lot of the, the, the court cases. The government are appealing. They put a veto down. Um, I, I mention this only because uh, the, the case is going to the court on Monday. And yesterday, we did, uh, I think we did a big piece about Prince Charles to sort of set up the story. And then online yesterday, we put a poll up. Do you support, uh, do you think that, that we should know what Prince Charles's letters say? And this was done editorially and journalistically because that's what journalists do. The lawyers were going, oh, we really don't think that's a very good idea because supposing they say no, we don't support it. And the first thing that's going to be opened in court is the Guardian's own readers don't support the disclosure of this information. I suspect that our readers will support it because we know a little bit about what our audience is. Um, but, you know, I think it's, it is quite interesting. You can, you can find out just with online polls these days very quickly. Um, I mean, there are, there are pros and cons with that. Um, and the second thing I wanted to say is, you know, and this comes back to, to topics that have been mentioned before. Um, traditionally, uh, actually, one of the difficulties for newspapers was we didn't know who our readers were, not on an individual basis. People who bought the newspaper from a, from a news agent every day, we knew nothing about them. We could do some surveys and we would know roughly what social group they, they fitted into, but not much more than that. The advantage of online is you can find out so much about your readers. You know, not just social class, age, sex, what they like, what they don't like, where they've been shopping, what their interests are, and you can start tailoring all sorts of things. So your ability to engage with your audience on one level is much greater and can be much more tailored. Um, but I think you also have to be careful how that pans out. And, you know, even in The Guardian these days, we have big, we're having big discussions because there's a commercial end of the organization wants to drive our traffic, wants to get us, you know, in comments, curiously, um, comments are considered to be a great traffic driver. You know, they're numbers, and numbers then go back to advertisers, and advertisers are what, in this day and age, are going to keep us going. So, you know, the complexities around knowing your audience and the public, you know, the, the Guardian's done fantastically since the internet, because we, we've managed to hit a global audience that was a very limited audience on hard copy in the UK. Um, so some of these things are, you know, give you all sorts of opportunities, but you also ultimately have to respect that audience and engage with them and, and use their skills as well. And, you know, I think that's one of the things we've learned. A couple of times we've put up documents, some complicated tax trust on something, which we just didn't understand. And we go, hey, someone out there must know what this is. Someone must be able to explain it to us and to our readers what it is and what it means. So, you know, there are all these benefits, um, but responsibilities as well. So I think you want to have the public feel they have a stake in whether this news report gets heard or not. How do you organize the public? That's what the civil society actors are supposed to be helping the journalists with. Um, so I think you'll have many more discussions during the course of this weekend. If anyone has a case study, in which they can answer some of the questions that uh, our friend here is posing, please seek him out and tell him about your experience and what solutions you might have for him. Uh, next question or comment. Yes, uh, Peter. I would like to ask about... Say who you are, please. Oh, Peter Moland, I'm here at CU and work on freedom of speech issues. So my question is about the an issue which is crucial for democracy the freedom to criticize public officials and public figures, and how, the, in your view, the evolving European approach can be reconciled with open journalism. And what I mean specifically is that in the US, one can be held responsible for uh, publishing defamatory uh, facts only if uh, does it in, uh, uh, with intent or so-called reckless disregard. So if we talk about responsibility and responsible journalism, I understand it's important, but in, in a way it's the end of freedom of speech and freedom of the press, if that becomes a standard. So that's why it's very important that in the US, responsibility can include writing defamatory facts 
uh, with negligence, with some negligence. That is still fine. In Europe, as opposed, as opposed to that, in Europe, there is talk, so the legal standard tends to include responsible journalism, and that has been dangerous already before, and I finish with this, uh, but, but uh, even when, when editors and, and, and journalists were doing the job only themselves, but, but when open journalism brings in a lot more many people, then it seems to be more of a challenge, so it seems to be Europe, in Europe we should move towards the reckless disregard approach, and that's my question, how much chance you see for that, or how can you see the reconciliation of these things? Thank you. Should Europe adopt a reckless disregard uh, provision? Well, when it comes to First Amendment protections, actually, it's not even reckless disregard. Um, from the perspective of New York Times and Sullivan, as, as my students know, it's actually malice. Um, so the, the First Amendment protection is, is stronger than the European, and the European jurisprudence has been criticized, um, especially in cases concerning defamation under Article 10 in recent years. Um, having said that, I, th I still think that the Strasbourg jurisprudence offers a strong protection of freedom of the media. And even though, um, you know, maybe America offers a higher level of protection when it comes to defamation um, in connection with public officials. We should not consider like Strasbourg as, as being appalling or um, or presenting a, a low standard. Um, so, uh, you know, th there have been some cases where the notion of responsible journalism has come out, particularly in. Um, uh, um, cases concerning defamation from a, from a few years ago, but I think the trend for protection of the media has is now experiencing an, an upward swing. Um, so, yeah. Um, I just want to say when I hear about responsible journalism, suddenly alarm bells ring because that's quite often the reason why the rich and the powerful use to suppress. Uh, journalists. We need responsible journalists. We need more responsible journalism. Well, frankly, we need freedom of expression. Um, and a little bit of ir irresponsibility uh, is also okay uh, from our perspective. And it's really uh, the powerful, the public figures do need to have a higher level of tolerance when it comes to public discourse and criticisms. Of course, I mean, this is, should not be the right of anybody to say absolutely anything against anybody, but they do, ne do need to step back and say, look, I'm in a public position, and therefore I cannot really take everybody to court who is critical of whatever position I take. So that's why when it comes to you know, responsible journalism, we need to be very careful about trying to put this as a priority. I mean, I think it's always been recognized that the, the, the freedom of expression includes the right to make mistakes um, as long as when you are aware properly that you have made a mistake, you correct it promptly and quickly and in, the, in, in, a, in a prominent fashion. Uh, and, you know, in the UK, we've, been, we've, we've developed over the years what's, what became known as the Reynolds Responsible Journalism, which was really around as long as you try and get to the bottom of something, then if you get it wrong, uh, there is a defense there, providing you can show you've taken the right steps. Now, we've just introduced a new, we've got sort of abandoned Reynolds and gone for a new, uh, in defamation terms, section four of the new Defamation Act is around public interest. And, and that's quite interesting because that's sort of taking it away from journalists per se and putting it into a public interest, statements of public interest. So we're not just about journalists from anybody on one level um, should be protected, but we haven't really had any case law on that. So I think it'll be interesting to see whether that ends up going very close to Sullivan by a slightly circuitous route because th there's a whole resistance to Sullivan per se coming in. Um, and I mean, the other thing I think is interesting, you know, the US, First Amendment specifically has in it a protection of the press. Article 10 doesn't have a protection of the press in, in that same way. It's about free speech, which is something that is a right we all have. Um, so on, on one level, Article, uh, you know, Article 10 gives you lots and lots of, um, uh, of roots. The other thing I want to say about the rich and powerful, I mean, in the UK, and I don't know if this is a trend elsewhere, but what's happening, because we've, lo we've leveled out defamation a little, um, is that privacy and data protection 
are being used by the rich and the powerful to chill and suppress. And it's a really interesting, I think, you know, new area of conflict because the, the, it seems to me that the um, Court of Justice of the EU, the one that did Google Spain, uh, is, is a great privacy protector and respecter. Strasbourg has spent longer balancing those rights and is a bit more savvy, although even in Strasbourg there's a bit of a t tendency. And I, I can see privacy, and that privacy is being used by the rich and the famous uh, and commercial organizations, particularly corporate companies, at the moment in the UK, through data protection to, to, to chill and suppress. And, and you'll all know, you know, in Europe at the moment, we're debating a new data protection regulation. The idea is to try and make it more consistent in Europe. But I think we have to be really, really careful at the moment about, about our natural inclination to allow people's privacy to be properly protected but the way in which that can then be abused down the line. And you, know, you have to sort of see the dangers of these things now um, because they're lurking there. Uh, and, and I think you know, we might forget about defamation as a problem and we might be looking at this coming from a privacy angle. We have to do a lightning round. We have only 10 minutes left in this session. So uh, let's take a couple of questions and each of you has to decide which one you want to answer. I'm going to take two questions now. Uh, first, I see a young woman over there, and then Andras. I actually don't have a question. My name Comment. is... Comment. Yeah, and sorry. tell us who you yeah. are. My name is Bat. I'm a journalist from Poland. Uh, I'm not really good in law, but I know that there are some lawyers from Poland. So just to comment on that, I because... I can hear you. Can you say again who you are? Beata Biel. I'm from Poland. I'm a journalist. Poland. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, was, I was just going to comment that probably very little of you know that in Poland we have law, in criminal law, uh, we have um, a regulation called 212, which allows people to suit journalists in criminal cases for defamation, which we have been fighting with for many years, but it's still in criminal court. So it's not just a civil thing, but, and it's often used even by politicians. So this is the problem we're, we're dealing with, but we don't see many hopes with that yet. So just to comment, thank you. I know this is something that the OSCE works on. Before Dunya was in there, Miklos yeah. uh, Harasti was working on these issues. Yes, uh, and uh, Andras here, Petr. Hello, my name is Andras Petr. I'm a journalist from here, from Hungary, and I have a question for Jill. Uh, you said that this is a learning process, and uh, yeah, I would like to know what did you learn from the NSA story? Uh, what uh, what would you do differently, you in the legal department and in the newsroom, if you if you received uh, the next chunk of uh, sensitive digital information? Okay. Um, I'll, I'll try and do, I mean, there's, there's lots of things. I mean, you know, on, on a practical level, one of the things we're doing at the moment is putting our, we're looking at moving quite a lot of our operations onto the cloud. And that has all sorts of issues around it. And I think one of the things that if we ever have a Snowden type thing we will do is we will not do any of that in any linked up way. We will do it in a closed basement with computers that are not linked into anything uh, and you know, that, that will happen. That is the only safe way in that really high extreme thing to do. I mean, that's a practical point. Be, be very, very aware of, of you know, who's looking, who can get whatever. Um, the second point legally that I would make as a, as a lesson that we've learned both from WikiLeaks and from Snowden is the enormous benefit for us uh, of collaborating with journalists around the world on these sorts of stories. Because the reality is, even if they try and close down you in one country, if you've collaborated, so that, you know, move away from exclusivity as being a big thing and your thing, share that exclusivity. Because then, as I say, if they, if, you know, there's a game in the UK called Whack-A-Mole. Do you know what that is? You hit the mole with what, with a hammer on one head and it pops up in a hole somewhere else. Um, and, you know, if you hit us in the UK and, and close us down, Someone's going to pop up somewhere else with the story. So there is a collaborative benefit to, to making those arrangements. And, you know, the U.S. is great because on pre-publication prior restraint, most of the time it's not going to happen in the U.S. So if you've got a U.S. collaborator, even if they completely manage to cut us out, we can pop up in the U.S. We can pop up in Europe. We can pop up in some, somewhere else. So those are just two of the really big things, I think, uh, that came out for me. 
Thank you. Um, when I was in the Czech Republic, anyone here from the Czech Republic? Wonderful. Um, I remember there was a story about uh, uh, Mr. Klaus's wife and uh, some of her bank arrangements. And uh, the Czech press at the time was nervous about publishing it because there would be real repercussions. And um, what they did was the German journalists covered the story, and then the Czechs could report the German press is saying this about Mrs. Klaus. And so this cross-border uh, collaboration can have many forms. It can be overt, as I just described, or it can be uh, just your network working. And I think you've just given us a good rationale for why this conference is so important. Um, we have time for maybe two more. Yes, uh, the gentleman here in the front. Um, Dumi is coming with the microphone. I'm Petri Saracini, coming from the Macedonian Institute for Media, and I would like to give a small example that relates also to Czech Republic and to some of the issues that were tackled here. I don't know whether you've heard that uh, the chief of our secret police, Mr. Mialkov, sued the most popular weekly in Macedonia, Focus, for uh, writing a story which basically uh, gave the statements of our ambassador in Czech Republic on the private businesses of the heads of the head of our secret police in the Czech Republic. So maybe this is a very unique case that you have a chief of secret police, also a businessman. It's a unique case in the world, maybe. And the unique case, I think, in the world, or maybe I, I'm not quite aware of that, but maybe the, uh, one of the rare cases, or I have, haven't heard a case of uh, chief of secret police suing media. That's, that happens very rare. Uh, the positive news from Macedonia is uh, not the, the fact that Focus lost the lawsuit for defamation for 9,300 euros, but that uh, there was an action. First, the Journalists Association asked, was publicly asking uh, from Mr. Mialkov to forgive. Many of people in the journalist community were angry because we felt that it, it's this is not the way it should be done, that we should not beg for forgiveness. And then we started online an action asking from focus audience to collect the money and from colleagues journalists. And we, we managed to do so in less than 10 days. So uh, the people of Macedonia paid for the uh, 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 aching heart or the, the problems, physical and psych uh, psychical problems that Mr. Mialkov had. Why? Uh, uh, for 20 years, Focus has been criticizing every government. Whenever government change, Focus editorial policy change. So the biggest threat for media and journalists is not the police, it's not the secret service, it's not the state, it's your credibility. If you have it, then you're fine. Your audience will buy you, you will be the most popular weekly in your country, and your audience will stand behind you in tough and difficult times. Wow, thank you for that story. Very good. We have time for one more. Yes, our Czech friend back here. My name is Eva Ondřeva. I'm a lawyer in Czech Republic, and I would like to raise a legal question related to open journalism. Because two years ago, people in my country found out that we are bound by e-commerce directive. And uh, thanks to notification services, uh, publishing houses are getting at the moment 10 or 15 notifications per week asking to take down opinions of ordinary people, also discussion. It's not the comments that are racistic or primary, illegal, but they are honest opinion. And unfortunately, some courts just do not understand what does it mean, the ISP liability and so on. So they think that we shall um, take down every content we get the notification to down. down. And in respect of the latest case, Delphi versus Estonia, do you think that uh, e-commerce directive in Europe can be a chilling effect on media? And do you think that the way US is dealing with this issue is much better? Thank you. Um, well, Delphi was decided against, against freedom of expression. 
um, and perhaps this is one of the consequences of, of the decision at the um, chamber level, um, the situation in the Czech Republic now, but Delphi is going to be appealed. In Delphi, um, what happened was um, the um, internet service provider was made liable for comments put on um, the, the portal, essentially, by a third party. Um, and in a um, decision which has been widely criticized, uh, the, the court basically let the, um, let the, I think it was defamation, it was a defamation, um, uh, um, it wasn't a conviction, but it was a, it was, um, a case, defamation case, let, the, let, let that defamation go um, or stand. Um, we don't know. I mean, Delphi, I think, is going to be decided in the Grand Chamber in the next few months. So I, I, I hope that it will be decided um, or reversed, the, the previous judgment. Um, but but we, we still don't know. I think it would be um, atrocious. It would be such a step back for freedom of expression if it were upheld. Um, so um, I, I think we just have to await that decision. Just, just add one thing. I mean, it's, it's deeply ironic in a way that um, the e-commerce e directive in the UK is sort of regarded as a bit of a liberator because the test in it is about unlawful uh, comment, which suggests you have to establish something by law that, that is unlawful as opposed to just being def defamatory, i.e. someone else is saying it. Um, uh, so there's a sort of irony about the twist in that, which is, was seen as advancing things in, in the UK. But I, mean, I think what it highlights is a, is a much more complex problem around all of this, which is what you do, you know, there's always been an issue legally. If you're put on notice that something is untrue, what do you do about it? And until you're put on notice, particularly if you're not really a publisher, if you're a search engine or something like that, you can sit back and, and plead ignorance. Once you're put on notice, the whole rules of the game and engagement change. And the real difficulty for below-the-line comment, uh, searches, etc., is that generally that, that is being done by organizations who have got no investment in, the, in that speech. They, they're not the ones who've put it up. They're not the ones who've thought about it. They're hosting it. They're offering a, a platform for it. And it's a really difficult call for them. Do you fight these things? Do you challenge it? Do you start investing in protecting someone else's speech? Or do you just take it down because life's too short and it's not your problem? You know, which is a, which is a, which is, which is a very pragmatic route to take. And, and in a way, that's what's happened with Google Spain as well. I mean, we're having this constant argument now. Do we just let Google carry on delinking from some of our stuff? Do we engage? It's, on one level, it's not our problem because our site's still there, our stuff's still there. And, and you know, these are really, there are legal issues and there are real practical issues and there are ethical issues around how you respond. And you know, this is part of what we're discussing because this is all new. You know, it, it's complicated and we haven't really got to answers yet um, involving you know, the rights of all these people who are involved in these debates. Front. Oh, sorry, go on. We have this, you know, this idea of right to be forgotten. We're getting maybe five to 20 requests uh, to put down something on our websites. And it's almost impossible to explain to people that you should apply, I mean, you should complain to Google. Because right to be forgotten doesn't mean that we should take down our article. It's just about the searches. So, um, yes, people are actually demanding us that, according to this right to be forgotten, that we actually remove content from our website which is not the case. And uh, I think those things are also very important and has a lot to do with journalism. Uh, I had sort of great cartoon just a couple of days ago on Twitter. It was Santa Claus. Um, we had a computer and he had a list of you know, naughty children and, uh, and good children. And the list of good children was full and the list of naughty children was empty. And his assistant said, well, you know, the problem is that all the naughty children are you know, applying to write to be forgotten so they're not on this list. <laughs> And that's going to be a big problem, I think, for, for what we do. No, I mean, that, that problem with, the, with regards to the European Court of Justice ruling on the right to be forgotten, we've also highlighted it and uh, have spoken out very clearly against it as a measure against freedom of expression. Um, maybe I would like to deal with your, your point with regards to um, uh, focus and uh, defamation and also your point in regards to criminal defamation. I think, uh, again, in the case of focus, it, it puts the 
puts the importance of having um, civil defamation which is limited and capped. And that's something that the point that we have raised in Macedonia on a number of occasions that it needs to be uh, clearly. And again, my point about public officials, which in this case need to have a much higher level of tolerance. And then the third point which I think comes into this is that if your source of information comes from a public source, then again, do you still have the same responsibility for the checks and balances comes into play? But um, the, as you said, the representative has mentioned many times um, the need to um, decriminalize uh, defamation, and that's something that we would advocate in absolutely all the OSCE participating states. And the last point is um, on the happy news from Macedonia that people chipped in together to uh, save focus from potential bankruptcy out of this case. I think that answers your question is what kind of audience do you want for your media? You want an engaged audience which is ready to step in and be part of the process and that's what open journalism also is. I think that's quite clear. It's audience that comes in and becomes part of your news making process and part of your production and in a way part of your financing at the end. Wonderful. We're going to wrap up now and you're going to get a tour of the actually quite magnificent and probably useful to you Open Society Archive. We're going to have our picture taken by a drone. We have a lot of fun ahead. You've been a very good participatory group. I wanted to give the panel one last chance to do a seven-second uh, intervention. Uh, to wrap up, I wanted to know if you have one piece of advice, each of you, for our group of incredibly engaged and uh, cutting-edge people here. So uh, let me start. Sejal, is your advice to go to Strasbourg with your case instead of the, the European? Uh, go ahead, Commission. On balance. Um, but I think it's something that um, uh, Vlad Jolin said it right at the beginning, which was about strength through interconnection. You know, building this network, I think, is very, very important. And the fact that you have lawyers amongst you and, um, you know, with you at, at this time, I think, is, I think is helpful. I mean, not necessarily going to Strasbourg, but you know, this, the, or, or the Court of Justice of the European Union. But knowing that these principles are applicable at the domestic level and ought to be um, implemented by uh, the courts, but also um, uh, state agencies as well. So, you know, th this is not just about um, going to Strasbourg. It's actually about um, human rights at home and uh, freedom of expression within the domestic context. Okay, I'm just going to sort of say collaboration. I mean, collaboration on all levels, legally, journalistically, um, helping each other out, forming networks, making groups, because that, that gives everybody power and a voice. It's almost a pity to say it, but your rights apply online and offline as well. It should be taken for granted. We would not need to repeat this, but that really needs to be understood by the governments as well. Don't become cynical. <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs>